In this lesson on liquids and solids, we're going to have a pretty comprehensive discussion about intermolecular forces, uh, including hydrogen bonding, dipole-dipole forces, linear dispersion forces, ion-dipole forces. Uh, we'll see how those relate to the bulk properties of like boiling point, melting point, surface tension, viscosity, vapor pressure. Uh, and then we'll have a discussion about phase diagrams, a plot of pressure versus temperature, where solids, liquid, gases are. We'll talk about the lines of equilibrium, the critical point, the triple point, things of this sort. And if you learn anything from this lesson, like it, share it, and subscribe if you'd like to be notified about future lessons I release. And if you're looking for good study guides and practice problems, check out chadsprep.com. My ultimate general chemistry prep course has currently over 1,200 questions and counting. All right, so in a discussion of intermolecular forces here, we're going to first start off by limiting ourselves to talking about these three intermolecular forces, hydrogen bonding, dipole-dipole forces, and Lenin dispersion forces. And the reason we'll, we'll start with just these three is that these three are the only options for a pure liquid. In a pure liquid, this is all that's available for the interaction between individual molecules. Uh, now, when we get to mixtures, we'll add on ion-dipole forces onto this. Now these three can also all be present in mixtures, but ion dipole forces imply that you have to have a mixture, which is why we'll leave them out of the discussion for now. Let's talk about first what an intermolecular force is. Well, let's say we take a look at a couple of HCl molecules here. So, and my first question for you is in a Lewis structure here, uh, what does that horizontal line depict right there? And hopefully you said covalent bond, because that would be correct. And a covalent bond is not at all what we're talking about when we talk about intermolecular forces. Intermolecular implies between separate molecules. So it turns out so the covalent bond actually holds a single molecule of HCl together. And in that case, we might call it an intramolecular force. So things of a sort. Uh, but the force we're talking about in this lesson is the force between separate molecules. And it turns out there's a rather weak attractive force, much weaker than an actual covalent bond. So that's actually attracting these two. And it's just due to plus and minus in every one of these cases. So if we look, HCl is a polar molecule. So, and chlorine being more electronegative, is partially negative and hydrogen being less electronegative is partially positive. And on the adjacent molecule, it is exactly the same situation. And so the attraction here is due to the fact that the chlorine on one molecule is partially negative and is attracted to the partially positive hydrogen on the next molecule over. Now the nature of this force is due to the fact that this molecule on the left is polar and this molecule on the right is polar. And obviously they're identical molecules. In a sample of HCl, you're going to have zillions of molecules. I'm just examining two. So I'm showing this in a pure liquid, let's say, but this would also happen in a mixture with different components as long as they were both polar. So because they're both polar, they both have a dipole moment. And so this interaction between two polar molecules is called a dipole-dipole force. So notice I'm not starting at the top, I'm kind of starting in the middle here, and this is of intermediate strength. We're gonna find they get stronger as we go up with hydrogen bonding being the strongest of these three. Cool, so this is a dipole-dipole force, and you just have to have polar molecules in this case to have it. It's just partial positive attraction to partial negative attraction on another molecule. Now, hydrogen bonding, I like to think of as a super duper strong dipole-dipole force. Now, I don't particularly care for the name. One, we use the word bonding in the name and it makes students think, oh, that's kind of as strong as a covalent bond, right? No, this is just an intermolecular force. And again, it's significantly, significantly weaker than an actual covalent bond. So let's keep that straight. Also, it's called hydrogen bonding, and it makes students think that all you got to have is hydrogen, and you can do hydrogen bonding. Well, and that's false, too. There's only three types of hydrogen atoms that can be involved in hydrogen bonding, and that is a hydrogen bonded to a fluorine, a hydrogen bonded to an oxygen, or a hydrogen bonded to a nitrogen. So I like to call these the phone elements, F-O-N. Those are the only hydrogens that can be involved. And the idea is that uh, fluorine is the most electronegative element, oxygen is second, and nitrogen's in the running for third or fourth, depending on who you talk to. So, but with these three very polar bonds, you're gonna get a hydrogen that has a very significant amount of partial positive charge. And it's only those hydrogens that can actually be involved in hydrogen bonding. So like the hydrogen bonded to a chlorine, it's polar, it's partially positive, but it's not as partially positive as these guys, and it's not gonna be involved in hydrogen bonding. So with one of these three very, very polar bonds to hydrogen, you can have hydrogen bonding. And water is very well known for having a significant degree of hydrogen bonding. And so if we take a look at a couple of different water molecules here, So the hydrogen bonding we'll look at is the interaction between a very partially positive hydrogen of one molecule and the partially negative 
oxygen of the adjacent molecule. And technically, it's actually mediated through the lone pair of electrons from the oxygen. And so in this case, with hydrogen bonding, we'd call the molecule that has the hydrogen involved the hydrogen bond donor. And we call the molecule that has the fluorine oxygen negative uh, sorry, fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen with a lone pair involved, the hydrogen bond acceptor. And so in this case, each water molecule having two H's bonded to O can act as a hydrogen bonder up to twice. So, and having two lone pairs on the oxygen can act as a hydrogen bond acceptor up to twice. And so each water molecule can actually be involved in hydrogen bonding with four other water molecules. Now in the liquid phase, you know, usually each water molecule, you know, they're moving around and stuff, is on average hydrogen bonding with somewhere between two and three other molecules. But when you freeze water, so it expands into ice, and it turns out it expands so that every single water molecule fits into a crystal structure where each water molecule is interacting with four other water molecules through hydrogen bonding. And so that's what causes water to expand, is this hydrogen bonding, giving it a very favorable structure with this very strong intermolecular force involved. All right, so hydrogen bonding, again, like a super duper duper strong dipole-dipole force and generally considerably stronger than all the other regular dipole-dipole forces, which is why they just decided to give it its own special name. All right, so then we'll talk about London dispersion forces. So, and London dispersion forces, it turns out that all molecules have them. Water has them, HCl has them. So, however, most notably, we'll talk about London dispersion forces for nonpolar molecules. Because if you're nonpolar, you don't have hydrogen bonding and you don't have dipole dipole, which means the only intermolecular force you'll have is London dispersion forces. But keep in mind again, all molecules have these. With water, we just often don't talk about it because if you've got you know, super glue, why would you talk about the scotch tape? So that's kind of the idea, but keep in mind that all molecules have these. Now, if you're nonpolar, this is all you got. So, and if we kind of take a look at an example, let's say I'm a nonpolar molecule and you're a nonpolar molecule and there should be, therefore, no reason we should be attracted to each other, except for the fact that our electrons are in motion. And let's say this marker here represents my electron cloud and it's rotating around me and freeze. And for this exact instant in time, my electrons are facing you. And so facing you, I appear to be a little bit negative. And so what you do is you take your electrons and spin them around behind you. That way facing me, you're a little bit positive. And I look at you and you're positive and you look at me and I'm negative. We say, hey, we should hang out sometime. And then our, both of our electrons move. We're like, oh, never mind. So it is a weak, temporary, or transient dipole. It's not a permanent dipole. If you have a permanent dipole, you got dipole dipole forces. But if it's just a weak, temporary, or transient dipole, so just due to the motion of electrons, then this is what it amounts to. And it's the weakest of the intermolecular forces. Now, the truth is, though, it totally depends on the size of the molecule, as well as the surface area. So it turns out bigger molecules are going to have more electrons and therefore have bigger London dispersion forces. And it turns out even bigger atoms as you go down to a group, not only do they have more electrons, but that we, we say they're more polarizable. They have squishier electron clouds, which can cause them to have greater temporary dipoles, if you will. And so size plays a role, but also surface area. So if I told you that I was gonna take care of this old review sheet here and I was gonna coat it in say Elmer's glue on one side and then post it up on the board here, and the question is, would it stick? Well, it probably would, probably would. Now, if I took that same piece of paper, still coated on one side in Elmer's glue, and punched up into a ball and stuck it against the board here. So it might stick, it might not, but we can say this, it is way less likely to stick. And so it turns out that's the surface area part. So molecules with a smaller surface area, therefore have a smaller surface area to interact with other molecules and are gonna have smaller London dispersion forces overall. So again, London dispersion forces depend on size and surface area. And the truth is for really big molecules, these can actually get pretty large. So we said they are the weakest of the intermolecular forces, but they're additive depending on size and really big molecules can actually overcome, you know, uh, a lack of polarity or even in some cases, extreme cases, a lack of hydrogen bonding. And we'll talk about how you kind of distinguish those differences. Okay, so the reason identifying these intermolecular forces is important is it relates to some of the bulk properties of a liquid. So like the melting point or the boiling point, uh, what we call the surface tension or the viscosity as well as the vapor pressure. And before we get into those five things though, we just wanna take a look at a comparison here. So let's say we get three molecules here and I'm gonna pick methanol here and we'll compare him to methane and hydrogen. 
And we're going to compare these three molecules, and my question for you is which of these three has the greatest intermolecular forces? And cluing you in real quick, you should focus on that OH bond right there from the get-go. And if you have an OH bond, then you're going to be capable of hydrogen bonding. This is going to interact with adjacent molecules with the strongest of these three intermolecular forces. Cool. So if I just said which of these has the highest intermolecular force, you'd say CH3OH. Now if I said which of these has the weakest intermolecular forces, so you'd go with hydrogen. Well, I already know he's the strongest, so he's out. But CH4 and H2 both are nonpolar, and the only intermolecular force they have is the London dispersion forces. But it's totally size dependent. CH4's molecular weight is 16, H2's is 2, and CH4 has a much bigger surface area as well. And so due to its smaller size and surface area, H2 has a significantly lower intermolecular forces, London dispersion forces, than methane here in this case. And so he'd have the weakest overall intermolecular forces. Now, the reason that's important is, again, these intermolecular forces rate to the bulk properties of a liquid. So if you look like boiling a liquid, so in the liquid phase, the molecules are touching. But when you boil it, they get separated out by huge amounts of empty space. And so if they're touching in the liquid and then they're separated by empty space in the gas, you have to break apart any stickiness between the molecules. You have to overcome any intermolecular forces they have. And so the stronger those intermolecular forces, the more energy it's going to take and the higher the boiling temperature. And it works similarly for the melting point as well. So when you go from solid to liquid, you have to break some of those intermolecular forces. And again, the stronger they are, the more energy that's going to take as well. And so higher intermolecular forces leads to a higher boiling boiling point and a higher melting point. And so if I said which of these three compounds has the highest boiling point or the highest melting point, you'd say the one that had the strongest intermolecular forces, CH3OH, again being capable of hydrogen bonding. Now the other bulk properties we relate this to are uh, surface tension uh, and then viscosity. So surface tension, uh, if you kind of think of what if I told you I have a friend and my friend when he jumps off the diving board into the swimming pool, he actually walks on water just walks on the water. So one, you'd call me crazy. So, but then I might tell you that my friend is a water bug. So one, you might be like, well, Chad, you just don't apparently have enough friends or you're not getting out much. Well, I will tell you, I'm not getting out much. We're all not getting out much right now. We're all in isolation, right? So, but a water bug is my friend in this example. And that water bug is one light enough and two, it spreads out its weight over a big, big broad surface area that it doesn't actually break through the webbing of hydrogen bonding going on on the surface of the water. So that webbing, the water bug's light enough not to push through. Now, you or I jumping off a diving board, well, we're just fat, and we're going to plow right through. So that hydrogen bonding network. So, but that water bug light enough, spreading its weight out of, uh, amongst a, a broad enough surface area that it doesn't. And that's a measure of surface tension, that webbing at the surface of water. Another place you'll see this is if you like to fill up a glass. And if you fill it up slowly with a small trickle of water, you can actually fill that glass to where it bubbles up at the top, and you fill it a little fuller than the actual glass. And the reason you can fill it up fuller is that the bubble on top, again, you have this network of hydrogen bonding going on that holds that bubble in place, so to speak. So that's surface tension. And the greater the intermolecular forces, the greater the surface tension again. And so if I asked you which of these three has the highest surface tension, you'd say CH3OH, yet again, having the highest intermolecular forces. Now the next is viscosity. And you know, in kind of layman's term, we think about viscosity, we just think, well, how thickly the liquid pours or something like this, you know, and we think of things like honey and molasses and motor oil and things of this sort. And so the technical definition of viscosity of those deals with fluid flowing in straight lines. And so straight layers, if you will. And if you have two layers of fluid, viscosity is the friction between those layers. And the reason for that friction is because of attractive forces between the molecules in those layers. And if there's a lot of attractive forces, there'll be a lot of friction and they'll want to flow together, which is why viscous things tend to flow thickly, if you will, if that's even a word. Uh, but that's kind of the idea. And so the greater the intermolecular forces, yet again, then the greater the attraction between the layers and the more viscous that la liquid's going to be. And so if I said, which of these three would be the most viscous or have the highest viscosity, it would be CH3OH yet again. Now, the last one we got to talk about is the one that's going to be kind of counter on the trends, and it's going to be called vapor pressure. And let's get a good picture going here. So we're done with these for now. So let's say we've got a container. So, and we're going to have a liquid in this container. So, and there's going to be some rather large molecules here for the purpose of this illustration in that container. So, and those molecules 
are all having some intermolecular forces that are attracting them to each other and stuff like this. And they're moving around and some are faster and some are slower. There's this distribution of kinetic energies and stuff. So, but every once in a while, one of them makes a beeline for the surface. So, and if it's moving fast enough, it will actually have enough kinetic energy to jump out into the gas phase. So, however, some molecules won't have enough kinetic energy, and instead of having enough to jump out into the gas phase, it's still going to be attracted to all these liquid molecules, and the attraction be greater, would be greater than its kinetic energy. So, only the fastest molecules have enough to jump out into the gas phase up here and form a vapor. And the measure of how many of the molecules made it up here is called the vapor pressure. The more molecules you have up here as vapor, the greater the vapor pressure. The fewer the molecules you have up here as vapor, the lower the vapor pressure. And the idea is that if your liquid molecules have greater intermolecular forces, well then you're going to have to have molecules moving even faster to jump up into the vapor phase. So, and at any given temperature, you only have a certain fraction of molecules that are going to have that much kinetic energy. And the stickier these get, the smaller that fraction becomes and the fewer the molecules that actually make it up here. And so this is the one thing that's going to go down. The highest intermolecular forces doesn't have the highest vapor pressure and now actually has the lowest vapor pressure instead. And so again, I could ask you which of these compounds has the highest melting point, the highest boiling point, the highest surface tension, the highest viscosity, and it's CH3OH every time. But if I say which one's got the highest vapor pressure, well, it definitely ain't him. He's got the lowest vapor pressure. The highest vapor pressure would be associated with the molecule with the weakest intermolecular forces, which we said was going to be H2 out of these three. Cool. So those are the things you kind of compare based on intermolecular forces. And we would only make a comparison of those five bulk properties for pure liquids. We're not going to, you know, say, well, if you've got methanol mixed with water and you've got, you know, this over here mixture, you know, we're not going to make those comparisons on boiling points and stuff like that. Now we might say what kind of intermolecular forces you have in a mixture and which ones are stronger and stuff like that, but we're not going to relate those to bulk properties only for pure liquids. And that's why we restricted ourselves to talking only about these three intermolecular forces, because they're the ones that can be involved in pure liquids. Now, again, they also can be in mixtures, but they're the only ones in mi involved in pure liquids. So the one other intermolecular force we want to talk about, ion dipole forces. And even the name here implies that we have a mixture. We've got something ionic mixed with something with a dipole, something polar. So a most common example of this is when you dissolve like salt in water. You've got a salt, an ionic compound dissolved in water, a polar solvent in this case. And so say you dissolve that salt and you're going to get a sodium ion and a chloride ion. And they're both going to be interacting with some water molecules. Now for the sodium ions, they're going to be interacting with the oxygen of the water molecules because the sodium's partially positive. I'm sorry, the sodium's got a full positive charge, but the oxygens are partially negative. And so this interaction right here is what we call the ion dipole force. Now it turns out it depends on you know the charge of your ion, whether it's plus one, plus two, plus three, minus one, minus two, minus three, that, that's gonna affect the strength. And also the size of the ion. Turns out smaller ions will form stronger interactions and larger ions will form weaker ones and stuff like that. But in general, you should know that these ion dipole forces are stronger than even hydrogen bonding. Now that's not an absolute statement. For some of the strongest hydrogen bonding and some of the weaker ion dipole forces, it actually flips. But in general, ion dipole forces are usually stronger than hydrogen bonding. So if we look at the chloride ion now, so chloride being negative is actually going to want to interact with the hydrogens in the water molecules. So with the hydrogens being partially positive. Cool, and it's just some variable number of water molecules in either case. So, but this is what ion dipole interactions are, and it always implies you have a mixture. So, which is why we didn't bring it up before. Cool. So sometimes people talk about dipole, induced dipole, and things of this sort. I'm just going to leave that out. Some people just lump those together into London dispersion forces. So also just want to really quickly talk about what people call van der Waals forces. So van der Waals forces, depending on who you talk to, mean something a little bit different. So now van der Waals have been customarily become associated with London dispersion forces. And most of the time people, when they talk about van der Waals forces, they mean London dispersion forces. But technically, van der Waals forces encompass all of the intermolecular forces. Forces. However, 
more people just associate with London Dispersion Forces, and that's probably what you should do as well. So odds are that's what your instructor is going to use, and that's what your, your TAs are using, and that's what your friends are going to be using, and so things of this sort. So you probably should just think that Van der Waals Forces is synonymous with London Dispersion, FYI. So I want to do a couple more comparisons on some intermolecular forces before we move on. There's some comparisons that get l just a little bit tricky here and stuff like that. So we've seen that kind of hydrogen bonding rules the day most of the time for pure liquids. Again, ion dipole forces only being present in mixtures. And we want to compare some other pure liquids and see what's going on here as well. So if I give you, again, say CH3OH, ch 4 and H2, we already know that strongest intermolecular force was CH3OH because he's got hydrogen bonding and the others don't. And so hydrogen bonding is usually king when you're comparing pure substances. Cool, what if you don't have hydrogen bonding though? So let's just say you don't and you've got something like this and you might be like, well, Chad, that might have an FH bond. Well, actually, if you look at the structure, you've got carbon bonded to the three hydrogens and carbon bonded to the fluorine, but the hydrogens, none of them are actually bonded to fluorine in this structure. So there's no hydrogen bonding, but there are dipole-dipole forces and a dispersion. Now, if you compare these three, so you've got one that's polar, the other two aren't. But the truth is if you don't have hydrogen bonding, Polarity is probably not the most important thing, unless all the molecules are the same size. If they're the same size, then they're going to have roughly similar London dispersion forces. And in that case, dipole-dipole could be the, the distinguishing factor. However, if they're not similar in size, usually the biggest one's just going to have enough London dispersion to even overcome any lack of dipole-dipole forces. Well, in this comparison, that's not a problem because CH3F is the biggest molecule and the only polar molecule, and he was going to win no matter what. But let's say we change this comparison up a little bit. So and instead of H2 at the bottom here, let's say we go CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3. And now we have a problem because this last molecule with only CH bonds, those are nonpolar bonds. And if all your bonds are nonpolar, you're nonpolar. So nonpolar, nonpolar, but the top one's polar. And a lot of students think that the polar one should have the greatest intermolecular forces because dipole dipole forces are stronger than London dispersion. Well, they're stronger if your two molecules are the same size, having those extra dipole dipole forces or the greater dipole dipole forces would be the difference. But if your molecules aren't that similar in size, so in this case, if this molecule is probably, you know, at least 20% bigger than this guy, and he's way bigger than that, so that's going to be significant enough to give him enough extra London dispersion forces to overcome the fact that the CH3F also has dipole-dipole forces. And so if I asked you between these three compounds, which one's got the greatest intermolecular forces, you're supposed to realize that one, hydrogen bonding is off the table. None of them have it. And as long as that's the case, size is more important than polarity. If you have any more than like a 15, 20% difference in size, size is more important than polarity. The only time polarity will become the determining factor is if all your molecules are nearly identical in size. And so in this case, when I look at these, I'm just like, well, he's the biggest by a fair amount. He wins. He's going to have enough London dispersion forces to even make up for the fact that he doesn't have dipole-dipole forces and CH3F does. So greatest intermolecular forces is his last one, CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3. And because he's got the greatest intermolecular forces, he'd have the highest melting point, the highest boiling point, the highest surface tension, the highest viscosity, but the lowest vapor pressure. Cool. It's so one last little tricky comparison here. And I chose two hydrocarbons specifically because they're both nonpolar. And if they're both nonpolar, what's the only intermolecular force they have? Hopefully you said London dispersion forces, and that is totally true. And so we want to compare their size and surface area, and usually it comes down to size. However, these guys are isomers. They both have the formula C5H12, and they both have a molecular weight of 72. They're identical, but it's going to come down to surface area then. And so in this case, one of these has a much more compact structure than the other. So one of them is kind of like when we crumple that piece of paper up. So, and it gets a much more compact structure, and that's this branch structure right here. Branching kind of compacts the structure, making it have less surface area. And less surface area here is going to mean less London dispersion forces. And so the top molecule is going to have the greater London dispersion forces. If you think about like your intestines, your intestines are a long skinny tube with lots of surface area. And then even on inside there, you got the villi that kind of have tons of surface area being long drawn out structures and stuff like that. So, but once you get a lot of branching, that really compacts the structure, making it have less surface area. So if I asked you which of these two molecules has the highest boiling point, melting point, surface area, I'm sorry, surface tension or viscosity, it's definitely the top one, the one with no branching in its, in its formula here. So, but again, this usually comes into play with isomers 
that have exactly the same molecular weight. So if one of these was a little bit bigger than the other, I probably just wouldn't make it about surface area. I'd just make it about size. Cool. These are intermolecular forces. These are some of your common comparisons, and you probably just want to run through several examples to make sure you really got this. I tried to make sure I gave you an example of every kind of crazy comparison. Now, one thing we didn't talk about was comparing something nonpolar that's really big to something with hydrogen bonding. And the reason we didn't is that's a tough comparison. So to be big enough to have enough London forces to overcome a lack of polarity, maybe 20% bigger than the polar molecule and you'll do it. But to have enough, you know, for a nonpolar molecule to be big enough to overcome the fact that, you know, it wants to have more intermolecular forces than something with hydrogen bonding, it might have to be, you know, three, four, five times bigger. Not 20% bigger, like 300, 400, 500% uh, bigger, so to speak. And so, uh, but there's no like strict cutoff. And so if they're going to ask a question like this, they're going to make it huge. They're going to put something instead of like, you know, uh, here, like CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3, instead of five carbon chain, they might put like a 20 carbon chain or a 30 carbon chain. And if you compare that to water, well, it would win, even though it's nonpolar. But it has to be significantly bigger. And so, and how significant is that? There's no strict guideline for cutoff. And so usually if they're going to give that comparison, they're just going to go overboard with it and make it ginormous. So if it turned out, if you got like a 30 carbon chain, that's like a wax. And a wax is a solid at room temp even though it's nonpolar. So whereas water is a liquid at room temp, even though it's got hydrogen bonding. So those are the least likely comparison you're going to see. Usually hydrogen bonding is just going to win the day. All right, next on our list here, we're going to take a little time to look at phase diagrams and we'll look at a standard phase diagram and then we'll see what makes water and carbon dioxide unique, a little different from the standard. So in this case, we do a plot of pressure on the y-axis, temperature on the x-axis, and it separates the three phases. And we've got solids up over here, liquids here, gases here. So, and you're supposed to definitely know what regions those lie in. And it kind of makes sense if you kind of pick a point here and specifically I'm gonna pick the point of one atmosphere. And if you go from low to high temperature, we'll increase along that X axis here. You'll see what it will go from solid to liquid to gas as we normally experience with most substances like water. As you increase the temperature, you go from solid to liquid to gas. So it kind of makes sense where they lie and stuff like that in that regard. Um, cool. You should be able to identify all your different phase changes then as well. So if I tell you, you've got a solid right here, you, or let's say I've got a substance right here at that particular pressure and temperature, you'd know it was a solid, but if it crossed the line right here and I drew an arrow and said, Hey, identify the phase change. You should know all six of your phase changes and what they would look like on this kind of a diagram. That arrow right there from solid to liquid would be called melting or fusion. The reverse process would be called freezing or crystallization. If I went from liquid to gas, that would be boiling or vaporization. And from gas to liquid, that would be condensation, solid to gas, sublimation, gas back to solid, either deposition or more specifically vapor deposition. So know how to identify all your different phase changes on a graph like this. So you should also know something about these lines. These are called the lines of equilibrium because you have two phases in equilibrium with each other when you're on these lines. So if I told you that we had some water and this water was at negative 10 degrees Celsius, you'd know that was below the freezing point and one atmosphere in negative 10 degrees Celsius specifically, by the way, and you'd know it was ice solid. But if I told you that you had some liquid water at one atmosphere and positive 10 degrees Celsius, you'd know, oh, now I'm above the, the melting point or freezing point and it's going to be in the liquid phase. But if I told you that you had some water at one atmosphere right at zero degrees Celsius, well, then you'd know you're at the phase change temperature and you'd be right on this line of equilibrium. And when you're on that line of equilibrium, when you're right at the phase change temperature, you have the two phases in equilibrium together. And so in this case, right at zero, you have solid and liquid. You have liquid water and ice in equilibrium together. Cool. So that's why they call these the lines of equilibrium. So anywhere along this line over here, you have liquid and gas in equilibrium together. And anywhere along here, you have solid and gas in equilibrium together. And then finally, right where they all meet right here. So you have all three phases in equilibrium together. And so that gets a special name and we call it the triple point and aptly named because all three phases are in equilibrium at only that one point on the entire phase diagram. All right, a couple other things we should identify, and we kind of already started here. At one atmosphere, we kind of just drag this line across. So you can see 
the melting temperature or freezing temperature right there at one atmosphere, and then the boiling temperature, and I guess you could call it the condensation temperature, but nobody really says that. So right there as well at one atmosphere. And as long as you're talking about them at one atmosphere, we call those the normal points. And so this one right here, that's your normal melting point. And this one right here, that's your normal boiling point. Cool. So you should know that when we say normal melting point or boiling point, we mean the melting or boiling point at one atmosphere. And you can identify them on a, on a uh, phase diagram like this as long as the y-axis here is labeled to show you where one atmosphere lies. All right, one more important point here. And if you look at the solid liquid line of equilibrium, it just goes to the top of the graph. There's no cutoff here. It just goes to however, however much graph you want to show. It just keeps going. But that's not true about the liquid gas line of equilibrium. That liquid gas line of equilibrium stops right there. And we call that the critical point. And that critical point has a critical temperature and a critical pressure associated with it right at that point. And that critical point is kind of an interesting point. And a lot of students get lost on what that actually means. And, but the idea is that beyond that critical point, there is no liquid gas phase transition. So, and that's kind of weird. And, and, and it's kind of hard to visualize what, what, that, what does that mean? And stuff like that. So let's kind of look at this for a second. So let's say we've got a gas right here, gas right here. So, and let's say we take that gas and we jack up the pressure. Well, if we move up in pressure, at some point we're gonna cross that liquid gas line of equilibrium and it's gonna turn into a liquid. And so what's happening is you jack the pressure up, you're forcing the molecules closer and closer together. And if they get close enough, so the closer those molecules are, the more they feel their attractive forces. If this is water we're talking about, the hydrogen bonding they feel. So, and at some point, if they get close enough, the, the attractive forces are just going to win. And all of a sudden, all the molecules are just going to condense into a liquid. So, and it's a very sudden thing. It's not a very gradual thing. You know, as you jack up the pressure, the gas gets smaller, 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 and that's gradual. But once you hit that line of equilibrium, rapid reduction in volume when condensation takes place. And it's really, really visible. There used to be a, a professor who'd do this lovely demo and he'd take one of those big 55 gallon drums and before class started and before any students had come to lecture, he would fill it full of superheated steam and then he'd seal the top. And then he would take that 55 gallon drum and just wheel it off and throw it in the corner of the room. So, and then students would start filing in and he'd start lecturing. So, and the whole time that 55 gallon drum is just getting its temperature lower and lower. So for that superheated steam. And when it hits 100 degrees Celsius and crosses that line of equilibrium, as the temperature gets lower and lower and lower, all of a sudden, and it collapses into a liquid. And that whole 55 gallon drum implodes. All of a sudden now, there's still pressure from all the air pushing on the outside, but there's no more steam, or at least very little steam on the inside pushing back and the whole thing implodes. Makes a ginormously loud sound. It makes a great demo, scares the crap out of everybody. It's, it's beautiful. So, but it serves a purpose as well. So if you look at what's happening now, if we lower the temperature, well, if we lower the temperature, now the water molecules are moving slower and slower and slower. And at some point they will no longer have enough kinetic energy to overcome the attractive forces and the attractive forces win and it collapses into a liquid yet again. All right, so if we look at this critical point now, so what if we take this same gas we've had and instead of jacking up the pressure or lowering the temperature and crossing that line of equilibrium, let's say we just increase the temperature and then we increase the pressure and then we decrease the temperature and then we decrease the pressure. And at some point here, we've definitely turned into a liquid but where was that point? I mean, as soon as I crossed a line of equilibrium and it collapsed into a liquid, it was an obvious point, especially like in that example with the 55 gallon drum, the whole thing just imploded in an instant. But here there was never an obvious point when we became a liquid. Now we did, but when was that? Because as we jacked up, uh, when we increased the temperature here, the molecules are moving faster and faster and faster. And as we increased the pressure, they got closer and closer and closer and closer, but no condensation taking place. And then we lowered the temperature. So then the molecules moving slower and slower and slower. And then we lowered the pressure back down. But the question is, when did it become a liquid? Because there was no obvious point where it's like, oh, psst, there it is. That's, that's a liquid now. Because it never went through a phase transition. Beyond the critical point here, so at any temperature bigger than this, the molecules will have so much kinetic energy that it doesn't matter if you jack up the pressure and get them really close together, they will have enough kinetic energy to overcome 
any of the intermolecular attractive forces in those molecules, and it's never just going to condense into a liquid in an instant and go through a phase change. So and one thing you should know is that critical temperature then depends on the intermolecular forces. And molecules that have more intermolecular forces tend to have higher critical temperatures as well. So another way we can relate this back to our discussion on intermolecular forces here. All right, but that's what a critical temperature is the temperature beyond which there is no liquid gas phase transition. And so if you're down here, you got a gas, and if you're over here, you have a liquid. But if you're out over here, you have what's called a supercritical fluid. Supercritical meaning above the critical temperature fluid instead. Cool, that is your critical point. All right, let's take a look and see how in the world water and carbon dioxide are just a little bit different here. All right, this is water. So, and I drew in blue what makes this so different. I just should have drawn it in black, but I wanted to make sure it was really obvious what was different here. And we still have solid here, liquid here, gas here. That's all in the normal places. And so it's usually, and I've even actually amplified the slope here. It's usually very subtle here, but the key is this, this solid liquid line of equilibrium has a downhill negative slope. So it's mathematically a negative slope. Whereas your typical compound over here, that line has a positive slope. Now I've amplified it here to make it so it's obviously negative, but it's really subtle. So, but it is indeed a negative slope. And that is unusual. There's only a couple, you know, substances I can think of, and water is one of the two, that does this. Almost every other compound does this. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, everything that is unusual about water usually comes down to hydrogen bonding, and that's going to be the case here as well. So let's say we've got a substance here. So now let's say we've got that substance right under these conditions right here, and we jack up the pressure. Okay, well, right now it's a liquid, and if we jack up the pressure, at some point, we are going to cross that solid liquid line of equilibrium, and it's going to turn into the solid. And the idea is that you're putting pressure on this, this liquid, you're squeezing in on it. So, and generally, as you put pressure on a substance, it wants to get more and more compact, more and more dense in structure. And for most compounds, the solid's more dense than the liquid, and so it's going to cross that line and turn into a solid. So, however, if you've got water as a liquid, and you jack up the pressure, it just stays a liquid because that's what's unusual about water is the liquid again is more dense than the solid. When you freeze water, it expands, the solid's less dense. So, but you can do something interesting on the other side instead is you can have some solid right there and you can jack up the pressure and all of a sudden you cross that solid liquid line of equilibrium and it turns into a liquid instead. And this is really unusual. So. But this is really important. This is just a reflection again that ice actually is less dense than liquid water. And this is super important. Now, one, it has to do with, you know, when like the oceans freeze and stuff like that, it floats to the surface and it insulates the rest of the ocean from cold weather and prevents the oceans from freezing through and through, which would kill all life. And, you know, it's kind of important, I guess, killing all life and yada yada. But the really important thing is that this is vital for the game of hockey. So if you look at the way hockey works, we like to skate on ice. So... And it turns out that wet ice has far less friction than dry ice. Think about a slip and slide and taking a run on a slip and slide and jumping out onto that slip and slide and then realizing that you forgot to turn your hose on and you're gonna get a pink belly like no other, right? So because water on the slip and slide decreases the friction and you slide much better. But the same thing is true on ice. When ice is a little bit wet, it's much more slippery i.e. it just has less friction and stuff like that. And so the same thing is true in hockey and what happens in hockey, recall that pressure is force per unit area is that the hockey player's weight pushes a force down onto the ice and it does it right on the blade of his skate and that's why the blades of those skates are really really small they have a small surface area which leads to a large pressure right under the skate and as a result the ice right underneath the skate actually crosses that line of equilibrium and melts leading to less friction and you can skate a lot faster. I always thought it'd be kind of a cool prank to play on an NHL team or something like that. And so sneak into their rink and melt all their ice and get rid of it and replace it with dry ice. So in that way, dry ice doesn't have this negative slope. It has a positive slope. So you replace it with dry ice and they're going to skate around and they're going to like, why do I feel so slow today? So it'd be a, you know, really funny and a good laugh. And you know, until some of that dry ice, I guess, sublimed and they all asphyxiated and died. But up until that point, it would be really funny. I'm telling you. All right, so that's water. That's what makes water unusual. And the last one that's unusual is dry ice. It's carbon dioxide. And again, you notice with dry ice here, carbon dioxide, let's write that in. 
That solid liquid line of equilibrium does indeed have a positive slope. That's not the unusual part here. What's going to be unusual is where we find one atmosphere. So for one atmosphere, we're below the triple point. For most compounds, one atmosphere lies above the triple point. And so most compounds, as you heat them up, they go from solid to liquid to gas. But not carbon dioxide. For carbon dioxide, you heat up solid dry ice and you never get a liquid at one atmosphere. It goes straight to the gas and sublimes. And this is why they call it dry ice, right? It never feels wet because it never is. It's never liquid. If you want to have liquid carbon dioxide, it doesn't exist at one atmosphere. It only exists at elevated pressures. So this is the unusual part of carbon dioxide. So one atmosphere lies below that triple point. So if I asked you for the normal melting point of water, you'd say zero degrees Celsius. Now, if I asked you for the normal boiling point of water, you'd say 100 degrees Celsius. And again, normal meaning the uh, melting point and boiling point at one atmosphere. But if I asked you for the normal melting point and boiling point of carbon dioxide, it's a trick question because it doesn't have one. There is no melting point or boiling point at one atmosphere for carbon dioxide, and therefore it doesn't have a normal one. In this case, it has a sublimation point instead. Cool. Those are your phase diagrams. Know the standard. Know what makes water and carbon dioxide unique as well. And once again, if you are looking for some good practice problems on this stuff, check out chadsprep.com and my ultimate general chemistry prep course. Uh, and if you learned something in this video, like it, share it, and subscribe. You know the drill. Hope you're having a great day.